trust Levine, correct? Correct. Pronunciation on this? Okay, great. And again, thanks for, for making time for doing this. In your book, The Guardians of Finance, with uh, Jim Barth and Jerry Caprio, you argued that the, the crisis was not primarily due to macro factors, nor was it the result of a perfect storm, but rather was importantly the result of regulators committing what you called negligent homicide. Can you explain how you think that was the case? Sure. So the, the standard narrative that one hears, um, particularly from policymakers, is that this crisis was an accident, an accident caused by a confluence of events where there were large capital inflows from the rest of the world into the United States and where there were crazy types of financial innovations and this all combined with gaps in the regulatory structure such that we had a huge crisis. And in the book with uh, Barth and Caprio, our argument is not that these factors didn't contribute. Yes, there were international capital flows. Yes, there was a bubble in housing. There were regulatory gaps in the U.S. But the theme of the book is that if you look at the 10 to 15 years before the crisis, um, that the regulators, the Federal Reserve, the Securities and Exchange Commission, the OCC, all made systematic mistakes over a very long time that encouraged financial firms to take on excessive risk. And that the regulators when they were making these decisions over relatively calm periods, 1996 to 2006, when they were making these decisions, they were getting a lot of feedback information that their policies were destabilizing the financial system, and yet they didn't respond. So our view is that this is why we sort of classify it as negligent homicide, because they recklessly endangered the stability of the global financial system. You also um, you wrote uh, uh, something about regulators not only lacking the tools for enforcement, but incentives. Can you explain that a bit further? And so, of course, it's our responsibility if we're going to document that the regulators systematically made decisions that endangered the stability of the financial system, part of the issue is why did they do this? Okay, and so our view is that it was not power. It's not that the regulatory agencies lack power or the tools to deal with the growing instability in the financial system. Our argument is that for a variety of reasons, they lack the incentives to do so. And we're we're a little bit agnostic about exactly which features caused the regulators not to act. So let me let me give you a couple of examples. So many people have focused on the revolving door nature of financial regulation, where you have people from private financial firms become regulators, and then after a few years being regulators, go back to being um, senior partners in major financial firms. So, for example, right. Goldman Sachs is, is a great example. So the current president of the New York Fed came from Goldman Sachs. If we go back to presidents of the Federal Reserve, that president of the Federal Reserve is now a partner um, at, at Goldman Sachs. There have been a variety of members of Goldman Sachs who've gone on to become uh, secretary uh, of the Treasury, including Paulson and Rubin. And if you look at the SEC, um, this revolving door spins very rapidly there as well. So one argument is that the guardians of finance, the regulators, are not necessarily working for the public because they're very closely connected to the firms that they're supposed to regulate. So there's, there's another element as well, which focuses less on the corruptibility of regulators and more on basic human instinct. And so here, and this is, I think, where we would place most of our emphasis. So we are, um, especially since all of us have worked 
in entities very closely associated with financial regulation, some of us have worked in regulatory agencies themselves, almost yeah. all of our personal and professional interactions suggest that the regulators are kind of of the highest ethical standards. Now, we have never seen any evidence of inappropriate behavior. So we are very reluctant to embrace this view about the revolving door as being a major explanatory uh, feature in terms of explaining why regulators systematically made um, particular types of choices. So instead, what we have tended to uh, focus on is the, the human characteristic of conformity. So there's a beautiful book um, by Tobias Moskowitz called Scorecasting. And what he argues in there is he discusses in there is sports. And he asks the question, why does the home team enjoy such a huge advantage across many different sports? So across baseball and basketball, American football and soccer, cricket, and all of these around the world. And his argument with tremendous amounts of data, is that the home team enjoys such a big advantage not because of the performance of the players are different at home or away, but because the umpires are systematically biased in favor of the home team. They're not biased for any particular team. They're biased for the home team because of the home crowd. The umpires subconsciously want to please the home crowd. They want to conform to the community in which they're operating. And the same could be said for regulators, where the home crowd is clearly dominated by the financial services industry. So here the revolving door matters not because there's anything corrupt going on, but the, re the revolving door matters because it affects the community in which the regulators operate. So, for example, um, when regulators make a decision, it's always going to be the case that the financial service industry is right on top of all of those decisions by the regulatory agency. And the regulators are always going to hear it from the regulatory uh, the, 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 from the financial firms. However, the public they're basically in the bleachers, and their voices can't be heard. And so part of what might be going on is that the regulators are influenced by the home crowd in the same way that umpires and officials in sports are biased as well. And so this, this requires not that regulators are corrupt, but simply that regulators are human. So what's your... What's the, the, the suggestion that you have? What's the recommendation that you have, given the nature of um, the revolving door is not going to change much, that home field advantage right. is likely to continue, and that regulators exactly. and people in private industry are likely to go back and forth through this re revolving door uh, from here on out? Exactly. So what we argue is that the public needs to be able to get an informed, expert, and independent assessment of financial regulation. And right now it can't. It can't get the information because the regulatory agencies typically won't give it to them. Even if the regulatory agencies gave the information to the public, the public is simply not capable of sifting through all of that information and making an evaluation of the, the quality of financial regulation. In order to assess financial regulation, one needs a team, really a multidisciplinary team of economists, of accountants, of regulators, of lawyers, and of people with um, financial market expertise. And the public can't put all of that together to examine information that they currently don't have anyway. The only entities that have the information and the expertise are the regulatory agencies, and the regulatory agencies are not independent. They're either not independent of short-term politics, or as I just mentioned, they're not independent of the influences of private financial markets. 
So right. given that, what we re- what we recommend is the creation of a new type of institution, um, and we kind of give it the name the Sentinel um, because it's going to act as the public's sentry over financial regulation. Although you know, if one were going to put in, uh, put it together without with a with a less showy title, this is basically an OMB type entity but it's souped up to have enough expertise and skills to do its job. So what what do I mean? This entity needs to have a few characteristics. So it needs to be independent of short-term politics. So in that sense, it would be designed designed like the Fed, which is designed to be independent of short-term politics. But unlike the Fed, this new entity, this sentinel, sentinel, would have to be independent of financial markets. So the individuals that work for the Sentinel would have to be prohibited from going to work in private financial firms for a long time. For a long time, there are disagreements among the authors of the book over exactly what a long time means. In in your view, view, what's a long time? For me, a long time would be 10 years. That after you leave the Sentinel, one would have to wait 10 years before working for a private financial firm that would provide sufficient break such that it would be difficult to categorize that individual as part of a revolving door with private financial firms. So while he or she was working at the Sentinel, their incentives would be focused on giving an evaluation of regulation from the public's perspective. The other thing is that, the other characteristic is that the individuals, in order to get the expertise in the Sentinel, one would have to pay relatively close to market wages. So this would be very different from the types of wages that are currently paid in regulatory agencies. And these low wages, um, you know, foster, facilitate, certainly encourage the revolving door because they can make, people can make so much more in the private sector. So the Sentinel would have to pay serious wages in order to get and retain excellent people knowing that the, that they couldn't go to the private sector to cash in on their on their experiences. So the Sentinel would have a few it would only have one job and its one job would be to assess financial regulation from the public's perspective. It would write a report, it would deliver it to the government and it would be made public. It would only have one power. It could demand whatever information it wanted. So what the Sentinel will provide is an entity with the information, with the expertise, to provide an independent, impartial assessment of financial regulation. The regulatory agencies could dispute the analyses of the Sentinel. The Sentinel would have no regulatory power. It would simply allow a debate, an informed debate, to exist on financial regulatory issues. Currently, it's impossible for the public and the public's elected representatives to have an informed debate on financial regulation because they don't have the information. They don't have the expertise to examine financial regulation, and there's no independent entity from which they can get this assessment. In creating this sentinel, what's your what's the one element that you see uh, is needed to ensure that the this sort of independent a regulatory agency could, or it's not a regulatory agency, but uh, this independent body could do its job. What's the most essential element in creating this? So I, I think that it really needs, it, it, it needs the three things. It, it must be independent of political uh, influence and the influences of financial markets, or else it won't work. It must be able to demand whatever information it wants, or else the regulators will be able to hide what they're doing from the Sentinel. And it must have an independent source of revenue so that it can hire the staff in order to provide an expert assessment. So those three things must go together. If one eliminates any of them, it won't be able to add much to the current regulatory regime. How do you compare your recommendations to those of Professor Kane, who has called for, for example, an expanded oath of office for regulators and the threat of uh, taking away their 
some of their deferred compensation to get regulators to do uh, better jobs? So I think I view them much more as complements than substitutes. So part of what he wants to do is enhance the incentives of the regulators to force them to sign an oath that they will represent the public interest. And I think that for many people within the regulatory entities, they are, the vast majority are acting in the public interest, and perhaps this oath of office would help a bit. Okay. I think, however, that the, the majority of the bias that's emerging from the regulatory agencies is less a matter of corruption and more a matter of this overall environment in which they operate. I think in terms of the deferring compensation, I think that this sounds good and perhaps it could be operationalized, but I worry that the same types of problems that exist in terms of actually getting the regulators to act on behalf of the public would also make it difficult to design contracts to incentivize them to act on behalf of the public. In order to write a contract that's going to incentivize them to act on behalf of the public, you need the public to be able to monitor what the regulators are doing, which is exactly what we don't have. The public doesn't have the information or the expertise or access to an independent entity with the information and the expertise. Hence, I think the Sentinel is actually necessary for Professor Kane's proposals to have the type of effect that, they, that he wants them to have. Well, setting aside your recommendation for the Sentinel for a second, uh, what do you think of the changes recommended by or the changes made by the Dodd-Frank bill? And have any of the regulatory agencies gained any, uh, any strength from that bill, in your opinion? So I think that... Yes, the Fed has gained a lot of strength. So it's been given a huge amount of discretionary authority to define whatever it wants as systemically important and then regulate whatever entity it defines as systemically important. This has the advantage um, that the Fed can make sure that any entity that is large and could have pervasive effects in the economy, that it has the authority to supervise the activities of the, that entity. So this would have become useful in the, in the most recent crisis because the Fed didn't have the authority to oversee AIG. Um, and so that's part right. of the motivations for creating this. And I think that that's good. However, um, there are problems, and that is that, yes, it strengthens the Fed, but the problem is who monitors the Fed? So, again, right now the Fed has huge amounts of information, and the Fed has tremendous expertise. And now the Fed has even more discretionary power in terms of overseeing and supervising and regulating any entity that it deems important, because it doesn't have to define what is systemically important. Systemically important is anything that the Fed thinks is systemically important. And the problem is that we've created an entity, the Fed, We've made it independent of the legislative and the executive branches of government. And at the same time, the Fed is not independent of the financial services industry. Indeed, the banks within each of the districts of the Federal Reserve Banks help choose the presidents of the Federal Reserve Banks. And many people from the Fed go to financial firms after a few years at the Fed. So I think part of the proposals are wise in giving the Fed the ability to oversee any entity that might cause large macroeconomic effects. That's great. But at the same time, we need to take a step in order to govern, hold accountable this thing, the Fed, that is going to make these decisions on, on behalf, supposedly, supposedly. I want to finish up with the, uh, the the two metaphor here is this revolving door and the home field advantage. In your view, so then you didn't see so much of a problem with the 
the revolving door nature of people coming in and out of the financial world and back into government. Um, so in, in the end, do you think that changes need to be made within the regulatory agencies themselves, outside of your recommendation on the Sentinel, within these regulatory agencies to uh, either slow down or change that revolving door um, so it doesn't continue to provide this, quote, home field advantage that's, uh, that, you've, that you've cited here? Sure. So... So each of us have worked, has worked quite a bit in a variety of regulatory agencies and with senior supervisors. None of us have had any experiences um, of people behaving in an inappropriate way. So from a very personal level, it's difficult for the three of us to embrace sort of the revolving door story where the revolving door seems to suggest something corrupt about what's going on, it's difficult for any of us to embrace that. At the same time, we're economists, and we believe in incentives, because we've seen the power of incentives along many dimensions. And so given how rapidly the revolving door is spinning, just because we haven't experienced or seen anything underhanded, it certainly doesn't create an environment that one would want in something as important as financial regulation. The other part of the revolving door is that it contributes to this home field advantage. And it contributes not in a corrupt way, but in a very human way. So if as a regulator, my community, the people who I interact with on a regular basis, both because I'm regulating them because it's a daily part of my job, and also because I used to work with them a couple of years ago and may work with them in a couple of years, that becomes my home field. Those are the people with whom I interact on a regular basis. And so the sure. revolving door might foster a greater home field advantage for the financial services industry, even though it has nothing to do with anything underhanded. And in that sense, kind of getting back to the, the question, yes, I think it would be good outside of the Sentinel to take steps to break or at least slow down the how rapidly the revolving door is spinning. Professor Ross Levine from uh, Brown University, thanks for joining us. We appreciate it. Thanks a lot.